you know, Chinese uh, are not sentimental. They're not the sentimental people like us. We believe in friends and Yevo and this, that and the other. And uh, the Chinese believe in hard gains, hard strategic objectives to be realized within time frames. They're very clear what they mean to do. Uh, we should do anything, everything possible to undermine the United Nations. We should break down the non-proliferation order. Anything in which we haven't had a role to write the rules, we should begin to undermine. Destroy it. Because unless that happens, you'll always be a secondary power. Because you are not part of the people who wrote the rules. If you had been, you would have been in the Security Council. Not where you are, begging for a Security Council seat. And I always say, we don't deserve a Security Council seat. Why are we talking about Security Council seat? We don't deserve it. What have we done? What have we done to deserve a Security Council seat? Just because you're big? And with India, everybody tramples on us. And the only confidence we have in dealing with other countries is Pakistan. We beat up on Pakistan, we beat up, what are you going to do? Beat up on Bhutan, beat up on Sri Lanka, beat up on Maldives. Who are you going to take on next? Bangladesh? Why didn't you start taking on China? And that we don't do. Because that is the way to win respect. You have, when you, your enemy is, you take on a powerful enemy, it raises your stock, your status in the world. Which is why we have raised Pakistan's status, because we have accorded them equality to us. Think of how bad this is. The Indian Air Force killed it. Killed it. By importing the Jaguar, low-level fight. When Raj Mahindra had designed the Mark II of Marut, but um, Air Chief Marshal P.C. Lal and his cohort of people in Vayu Bhavan killed it. So what have we done with just about everything we have imported and we think we have license produced. We say it's made in India. It's not made in India. Made in India is when you design a weapon system, not when you screwdriver a uh, damn thing and say it's make in India. Very different thing. Yeah, morality, morality, what, that's the whole point now. What do I say in my, why India is not a great power yet? You know, what's this in the Krishna Swami and these guys are talking about morality? Where's the morality? You'll pay the money for it, for damn it. Because we cannot match up with China. Let's not fool ourselves. Just because you can put up a defensive posture and stance in the dark in our nice of Pradesh doesn't mean that you're going to win a contest should it come to it. And therefore, I've been saying vis-a-vis -vis China, let me just say this. How do you, I've said, how do you neutralize the Chinese superiority, conventional military superi you know, superiority? I said, we have to go nuclear. Why is Germany so reticent in upsetting China? Do you know that? Because they sell, you know, how many? Two million Mercedes Benzes last year in China. Do you think they're going to upset you? Uh, upset them? Please you? Do whatever has to be done. Establish relations with Taiwan. Openly. Even as they fooled around with Pakistan, they nuclear missile armed Pakistan. I've been saying since my time at the National Security Advisory Board, the first one, during Raj Bhai's time when it was set up, I asked the Foreign Secretary then, some chap called Raghunath, an idiot. He came before us in a plenary. I said, why did you not consider the option of nuclear missile arming all the neighbors of China's periphery? Hello friends, uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe to Defense Offense English and if you want to support us, uh, please uh, uh, check out the links that are flashing on the screen and in the pinned comment. Thank you. Jai and friends, you are watching Defensive Offense and I'm Webber. Uh, we are back with yet another podcast on Defensive Offense English. Uh, today we are joined by Professor Bharat Karnad. Uh, you have seen him on our channel uh, twice before also. And uh, he is one of the most uh, you know sought after uh, guests on our channel. And um, the first video that we did with uh, uh, Dr. Karnad was uh, when we hardly had 20,000 subscribers and uh, now we have we are reaching about 2 million and uh, we are uh, blessed to have him again and uh, very thank you sir for agreeing to do this no congratulations 2 million is a very large number thank you so much sir 
So, uh, sir, uh, the first question, um, we'll keep this discussion more on China-centric. Um, there is enough Pakistan on our channel already. Um, so, uh, so you, are, you have often said um, in your lectures and in your discussions that uh, uh, with regards to uh, Pakistan, Manmohan Singh had uh, reached to a certain uh, decision um, to resolve the Kashmir problem and he had a solution. But he developed cold feet because of the assumed pressure that could come from BJP. Um, so he could not take any decision at all uh, with regards to the solution. Uh, and it was uh, due to covert diplomacy. Uh, it was all result of covert diplomacy. So uh, why does diplomacy, uh, you believe that diplomacy can work with uh, Pakistan, but diplomacy can't work with China. For China, you need to uh, have a strong-handed approach. Yeah, basically, I think because, uh, you know, Kashmir, is, again, is a, it's a different kind, it's an organic dispute, meaning that uh, these were two countries that were uh, one, at it, and, you know, one at one time, and then they were partitioned and so on. You have basic problems arising out of that fact that you push, you know, your partitioned uh, living organism. So naturally, the two um, um, parts of it then would have difficulty in trying to settle things between themselves. As far as China is concerned, China has always been, uh, shall we say, uh, the other. Meaning that even as we think we understand the Pakistanis because they're so much like us, uh, we do not understand the Chinese at all because they owe the hill and owe the Himalayas and, and they are as inscrutable as ever. Um, that's something I think uh, is a liability as far as policy making is concerned. Of course, we have diplomats who have learned Mandarin and they uh, have specialized in China. They've been posted there in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Uh, but again, um, some of the basic lines were set um, even before independence. Uh, in the starting of the 20s, for instance, because people like uh, even Rabindranath Tagore and so on and so forth, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, who was then the um, uh, Sterling Professor at Oxford, they talked about uh, the commonalities between Asian cultures. And, and they talked about uh, China and, uh, and India in a free world, a free China, a free India, uh, leading Asia and the world. And that kind of uh, fairly unrealistic notions they entertained. Um, and they kept to it even after independence. Um, Nehru, for his own reasons, uh, thought that well, uh, between India and China, again, uh, it's a version of that Tagorean uh, notion of things, uh, that um, between the two of us, you'd be able to manage the affairs in Asia, and that will bring peace, because if there was peace between the two major players in Asia, there would naturally be pay, you know, peace in the rest of Asia. And that was the uh, kind of uh, thinking he had. Um, and he did everything he could to help China enter the international mainstream. So you might blame, you should, you know, we should all blame Nehru for actually uh, putting China in the Security Council, because that seat was offered India in the mid-50s by both Moscow and Washington. John Foster Dulles, the Eisenhower's Secretary of State, offered uh, the Taiwan seat, which was then China. Uh, they held the Chinese seat in the Security Council to India. Uh, we said, no, no, give it to China. So uh, this is the kind of uh, self-abnegation that has got us into trouble. We are too idealistic. We think the best of other people, um, uh, but somehow uh, get, uh, get it in the nick as a result. And uh, that's what happened. Because China, you know, Chinese uh, are not sentimental. They are not less sentimental people like us. We believe in friends and Yevo and this, that and the other. And uh, the Chinese believe in hard gains, hard strategic objectives to be realized within time frames. They're very clear what they mean to do. And, um, and by the way, the communist, the Chinese uh, thinking of the present day harks back to the thinking uh, from the First Republic of 1911, headed by Sun Yat-sen. So there's a continuity. For instance, Sun Yat-sen said in those days, uh, we, in 1911, well, how, how do you deal with uh, the ethnic minorities in China? 
he talked about the Uyghur Muslims we talk about so much these days. And he said, well, you know, we rubbed them out. What's happening 70, uh, what, 100 years later? They're rubbing the Uyghur Muslims out. Uh, likewise, they have genocidally, uh, you know, killed off the Tibetan culture. So it's the genocide of a culture and the people in Tibet who are very distinct and a very separate people. But by the time the Chinese got through with them, as part of, uh, you know, again, India giving up our rights, inherited rights uh, that we inherited from the British in Tibet. We voluntarily gave it up. We recognized China's uh, suzerainty over, uh, over Tibet and without anything in return. So we have a habit of giving away things without getting anything in return in the hope that it will generate enough goodwill and in turn will benefit from it. In real life it's not that way. You know, certainly in national affairs, uh, you don't trust countries. So, do, so just interrupting you here, um, does this uh, obsession of being a quote-unquote uh, responsible state and uh, not being assertive and disruptive as you argue in your books, um, has it really changed over the period of time? Because even today, I don't see that assertion and disruption being created by the Indian state. No, uh, you're quite right. Your observation is right. Um, unfortunately, the Indian state is uh, either too set in its ways or uh, whatever leader comes in, uh, they have the same kind of worldview and mindset and attitude. So it doesn't really change very much whether it was Manmohan Singh yesterday or Modi today. The fact of the matter is that you are cowed by China. That's a real fact. How can we, uh, you know, shout out and we uh, uh, act very aggressively and assertively where Pakistan is concerned, but we have our ta you know, tail between our legs when China comes into view? Why is it that uh, Modi, um, you know, is so solicitous of China? You look at him when he deals with Xi Jinping and when, um, say, Modi deals with uh, some other third world countries when they come here, the African leaders. You no, know, he's proconsular in attitude. While in China, he's trying to, you know... Bromance. Uh, you know, trying to... Well, I don't think about his bromance at all. It's more uh, virtually a supplicatory attitude, uh, which the Chinese like, by the way, because in the Chinese culture, uh, the Yellow Emperor... Uh, if in, in that time, and this is in the general Chinese thinking, even trade is considered tribute. So if you want to trade with China, they'll say they're coming to you with tribute, meaning they are acknowledging your superiority. This is their attitude. This is their notion of Zhongguo, the central kingdom. They are the center of the world. That's their attitude. So whoever the else, the other countries, the barbarian. The difference with uh, India is that, unfortunately for China, and therefore there's that slight little twitch there when they deal with India, is that most of the cultural influences have come from India. Buddhism, uh, various other things, over the years, over, over millennia. And so they're very, very mindful. If you go to China, for instance, they have the legends of the Monkey God. Yes. Where's that come from? Right? It's the, it's the Indian icons that have seeped into the Chinese culture. That's why they feel, gosh, these guys are really not in inferior to us. But, you know, because we are stronger, we are more powerful, we should keep them down. That's the attitude. Um, so, um, that I think is the basic reason why our leaders haven't gotten out of the penumbra as a shadow of China because we seem in some sense diffident, meaning not confident enough uh, to deal with China on equal terms. We somehow concede that they are superior to us, uh, maybe because they are militarily more powerful and they are, uh, they are politically more powerful and economically, of course. Uh, they, they are a very rich country compared to India and uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, in some sense then, we are party to China's rise. We have helped them rise. Had we been clear-headed, 
had Nehru been clear-headed, he would have said, oh, screw China, uh, we'll not let them in, get into security council, and then not let China in, as they have done to us. There's no goodwill there. When they got in, they closed the door for India. And it doesn't matter now. That's why I've said uh, we should do anything, everything possible to undermine the United Nations. We should break down the non-proliferation order. Anything in which we haven't had a role to write the rules, we should begin to undermine. Destroy it. Because unless that happens, you'll always be a secondary power. Because you are not part of the people who wrote the rules. If you had been, you would have been in the Security Council. Not where you are, begging for a Security Council seat. And I always said, we don't deserve a Security Council seat. Why are we talking about a Security Council seat? We don't deserve it. What have we done? What have we done to deserve a Security Council seat? Just because you're big? So what? You know, a big doesn't, a big means usually fat and uh, lax and uh, the kind of uh, mental looseness uh, that's associated with, you know, fat people wrongly, I think. Yeah. But the point I think to make is that unless you are aggressive and you have been assertive and you have helped out lesser countries as you went along and created goodwill, but with the powerful you stood your ground, that is how you make a mark in the world. And that's when people recognize this country is great. But with India, everybody tramples on us. And the only confidence we have in dealing with other countries is Pakistan. We beat up on Pakistan, we beat up, what are you going to do? Beat up on Bhutan, beat up on Sri Lanka, beat up on Maldives. Who are you going to take on next? Bangladesh? Why didn't you start taking on China? And that we don't do. Because that is the way to win respect. You have, when you, your enemy is, you take on a powerful enemy, it raises your stock, your status in the world. Which is why we have raised Pakistan's status. Because we have accorded them equality to us. Think of how bad this is. China doesn't accord us equality. They still fear Vietnamese. Say so you are real, we are nothing compared to us. That's the attitude. And look at how we treat Pakistan. I mean, it's almost, it's frustrating to me that so obvious a thing doesn't get recognized with the government of India. And this, this is something I've been saying from my time in the Finance Commission and government, you know, National Security Advisory Board. We are so damned fixated on small things, small game, rather than the big game big threat, big danger, that we end up playing small for small stakes. And yet you want to be counted amongst the great parts, you want to be in the Security Council, really? So, but Chinese still respect Vietnamese. I mean, uh, they, they think twice before. For a reason. Mm -hmm. Because Vietnamese are the only people in the world that haven't taken subjection easily. They're the only people in the modern era. If you go to Vietnam, they'll tell you, they'll remind you that we have had an ongoing thousand-year war with China. And we will not let them, they never say we'll beat them, because they know they're not big enough to beat them. But we'll never let them rule over us or coerce us. They're the only country in the world that beat serially, beat... America. No, not just America. France first. The colonial power beat them. In Dien Bien Phu, in 1953, the great battle of Dien Bien Phu. What happened? They decimated the Chinese, the French armies. You know, with great generals who were making a name so-called, you know, French are useless fighters. They can't fight at all. But in the you know, Jean Le Grand and so on and so forth, they went to Vietnam, they got beaten. By, do you know who the great Marshal Won Giap, General Won Giap was of the Vietnamese army? He was a sergeant in the French colonial forces. Do you understand? A sergeant is a subedar major in the Indian army. As a patriot, he got out, led the guerrilla forces defeated the colonial army 
perhaps the greatest general of the 20th century, in my, in my view. And so therefore you had this extraordinary metal of the Vietnamese that you can literally see when you go to Vietnam, I have been there. Um, and so when you beat the French, then you go ahead and beat the Americans, and four years later you beat the Chinese. The 1979 Chinese invasion was so devastating for the Chinese that the marshal of the group army, I think it was the 30th or whatever, the group army that came into Vietnam, uh, virtually said Toba Toba and ran away, you know. They declared victory and got the hell out. They don't want to feel a fool around with China because they know they're going to get the bloody nose. Right? Who is afraid of us? I'd rather be feared than loved. I'd rather be respected than loved. If you want to be loved, you'll never gain respect by wanting to be loved. But you have to, you know, you know, again, as I said, it depends on who you show your love to and respect to. To your neighbors, smaller neighbors, including Pakistan, if you were generous, if you were, you know, had the goodwill, say, Tika, you know, you can afford to literally subsidize all your economies. You export anything you want to us. We can absorb it. We are a huge market, very good subcontinental market. Come in, sell your thing. Your economies rise and it creates such goodwill because to be a great power, first step is you have to have a pacified neighborhood. Do we have even one neighbor who has absolute faith, trust, and goodwill vis-a-vis -vis India? One, one neighbor. No. No. Where's the great power notion? So when we don't get the basic and great power notions right, how do you expect to become one? Some, um, Sun Tzu, uh, he said, ki, um, be subtle and use spies for all sorts of business. We see in uh, today's China, for past 75 years, uh, the PLA China, um, we have seen uh, Chinese uh, overtaking major economies in the world and they have been growing in silence, both economically and militarily. Um, now they have started making noises. Now they have started taking over you know, people, they have started bullying the neighbors. Now they are basically asserting power now. Till now, they were just taking on powers. So, so how do you think the like, Chinese seem to be very much grounded? They know their legends. They follow their uh, wisdom. Um, but on the other hand, we also had uh, great thinkers like Cortelia, uh, who was no lesser mind than Sun Tzu. But uh, we don't seem to follow uh, Cortelia. Yeah, we talk about them. We hold seminars. But at a government level, at a policy level, we don't follow them. At policy level, what we see, uh, so today is this prime minister, so this is the policy, and tomorrow some other prime minister will be there, so a new policy will come, and day after, some other policy. So there are so many policy switches based on the personality who's leading the government. I mean, how are we going to compete China anyway? Yeah, but then, you know, this is uh, one of the attributes of democracy, that a new government brings with it, it's new, you know, parameters of policy. That's, well, and that's the, shall we say, the downside of a democracy. Uh, but d democracy cannot be used in, as an excuse. Because in the people, there's that strategic mindset and the ability to think strategically that's missing. Even, I mean, just normal individuals, you think of it. I mean, you maybe most of the people are so impoverished, they can't, you know, think beyond the next meal. In that sense, you are restricted and limited. Uh, but the trouble is when you can't look beyond your nose and you, if you're in government, and you, a new government comes in, and only what changes, not that you look far beyond your nose, but you look little askance and look still just beyond your nose. You still don't see the, have the long view. You don't have the long view. I mean, it's all right for Modiji to say, uh, by 1947, whenever our centenary uh, will be uh, Swarna Bharat or whatever it is, Golden uh, India. Uh, well, that's all very good. 
and he has done a lot of things that are tremendous, digitizing the economy and so on. Great things. I mean, no question about it. And we are taking the right kind of steps in that direction. But the trouble really is that, um, you know, ultimately, you really have to step out in the world with power. Otherwise, Singapore would be a great power. Why isn't Singapore a great power? Or any of the European states? They're the small states, you know, but, but they are very rich countries. And, and uh, they have the kind of uh, influence and clout uh, that India is beginning to have in a cumulative sense. Uh, but it doesn't have in detail, if you know what I mean. So uh, the reasons for why we are not what we could be is because of all these weaknesses that I talked about. Um, and when you say Chanakya, I think, look, there's a great difference between Chanakya and Sun Tzu. Uh, Sun Tzu was focused clearly and fixedly on military strategy. Chanakya was more on military, on more on the administration of state, by the way. His foreign policy, the mandala system that he talked about and so on. And by the way, Chanakya is not uh, you know, when you say Arthashastra, uh, people don't realize that, that it's mainly a codicil. A codicil is mainly a combination of wisdom, yeah. of traditional wisdom. So the real source books are the Vedas. Yes, the Rig Veda. But... Rig Veda in particular. But it is extremely vigorous, extremely bloody minded. I, I argued um, in, in, not in my first book, Nuclear Weapons in Indian Security, that that bloody-mindedness, the strategic viewpoint, that assertiveness, that ag aggressiveness has been leaked out of us, seeped out of us. Um, uh, and, and, and so we are a very elevated nation to a point where I think uh, Polish sociologists, unlike Vietnam, by the way, who have never taken subjection easily, uh, they have said, uh, that India is a land of subjugations. Yeah? Stanislav Andreski is the Polish sociologist. What a great insight into India. He said India is a land of subjugations. Repeat it. And it's not just, you know, whoever came in uh, the 7th century, the Mir Qasim or whatever it is. Or, it is from before that. Anybody who came down across the Khyber and the Bolan passes could just take over India. That easy. So, who is to blame? You can say, you know, the local Rajas, Maja, Maharajas, we're all to blame because they fought each other. And you know, that, that the whole notion of uh, Jai Chand or uh, Mir Kas, uh, Mir Zafar and Mir Kas, uh, Mir Jafar and all Mir Sadik, Mir Sadik, Mir Jafar, Mir Sadik was in uh, Tipu Sultan. Yes, uh, Mir Jafar with, uh, with yeah, Murshidabad. Uh, yeah. So you know you have these kinds of inherited, in embedded cultural traits. Baby Ji Huzur every time, everywhere. I hate it. I don't like it that India is a, a supplicant. But politicians love it. Bureaucrats love it. That is the, well, shall we say, that's the habit. But this is the point. The Indians by nature are also that way. We see a little a powerful person, we count out to them, don't we? We see a little weaker and then we... No. Anyone in power, we count out to them. You don't see that elsewhere. Hmm. I lived a third of my life in America. I haven't seen it elsewhere. I don't see it anywhere. So, we have to self-examine and be self-critical. It's always very easy to blame somebody else. America or somebody else, you know, Muslim or something. Anyway, the trouble is that we are a little too easily swayed by blaming others. 
you know, uh, because it's so easy. You can blame your troubles for somebody else. How about looking in inward and finding what great deficiencies there are in our perceiving the world and India's place in it? It is also often um, argued that um, Nehru was one of the best external affairs minister in our history. By the way, uh, I'm not a Nehru hater. Uh, Nehru has a lot of a lot of things, great things that he has done for this country. Like uh, he has built institutions, um, you know, IITs, this and that, and everything. And uh, apart from that, the first fighter aircraft, HL Marut, was uh, like it got built under his rule. So, but apart from that. How much do you agree with this notion that he has been the best external affairs minister that India ever had? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I think he has not just been the best external affairs minister, he has been the best strategist, the classical statesman that India has ever had. And by the way, I, I, I came to that conclusion uh, well, in my book, Nuclear Weapons Indian Security, because, you know, he's the, here's a man who really had the classical statesman's worldview and attitude and mindset. For instance, we have been an arms import importing country from day one, right? What did he do? First of all, he thought through. He said science and technology is going to drive our military policies. He meant that, you know, if you have science and DRDO, he set up the DRDO and so on. Uh, you would start with basic sciences and you build up and that will in turn produce technologies which in turn, so far sighted, will replace manpower in the military. He was the think ahead as to what is happening now to autonomous armament systems, drones, robotic systems, they're all coming into the battlefield. They thought about it then as a way of reducing the army strength. You know, you might say, but, you know, if you reduce your army strength and there's China, then there's, you know, you ended up in the wrong side of the equation, power equation, perhaps. But his thinking was right. That he thought about science and technology as a means of advancing your military. Secondly, what did he do? Instead of importing arms, he mentioned Marut. The greatest thing that he ever did, he imported the greatest aircraft designer of its time in the 50s. Do you know who? The Nazi aircraft designer, Dr. Tank, Kurt Tank. He had run away to Argentina because he, you know, he was Nazi, he but brought him from Argentina, gave him a commission to design the first supersonic fighter jet. And do you know how Quickly, he produced it. He got the commission in 56. By 1961, he was flying over the Bangalore skies. He had produced some of the most legendary aircraft of the Luftwaffe, the, the German uh, Air Force, in the Second World War. The, uh, uh, his most famous was the Focke-Wulf uh, 106, I think. I might get the numeral wrong, but it was a fighter bomber. He was amongst the first one to actually devise a jet engine. Had Hitler invested more monies, Germany would have won the war. Hitler, again, didn't have the, you know, he, he lacked the brains in some sense. When it came to technology, he didn't appreciate what was being done. So, he had Kurt Tang designing Maru, age of 24. Even now, you go to Indian Air Force stalwarts who flew the Marut. They say, they have told me, Bharat, it was the only plane that could cruise without afterburners. Unheard of. At supersonic speeds. <laughs> Aerodynamically, it was so beautiful. It's a technological marvel. When you cruise at supersonic speeds without afterburners, that means you, you have to be aerody aerodynamically so efficient that it allows you to do that, the design, the structure. Anyway, he produced the Marut. He trained a team of Indian engineers, including Dr. Ghatke Patil, who 
followed him. He second in command was Dr. Raj Mahindra. And even now again, it was a, it could fly high, it could fly mid-level, it could fly low level. One plane. And those again, I just can recall a number of air marshals who flew when they were young, a flight lieutenants in the Marut squadrons, and they still talk about how beautiful the plane was at low. He said there was no quiver at low f low level flying. Because low level there's a lot of friction, air friction. He said, beautiful, it's a stuff. It's like a slicing through butter, hot knife through butter. That was the plane we had. The Indian Air Force killed it. Killed it. By importing the Jaguar, low-level fight. When Raj Mahindra had designed the Mark II of Marut. But um, Air Chief Marshal P.C. Lal and his cohort of people in Vayu Bhavan killed it. And Jagjeevan Ram was uh, the defense minister, if you recall. Uh, and he was uh, took money, you know, let us bet that yes. public knowledge, as you know, the Jaguar deal. Thereafter, it became a norm. Because on the basis that the party requires money, we started importing things. And the government of the day said arms sales are the best way to get money for our party. Of course, most of the money went into their pocket or in Swiss accounts or offshore accounts. But the, but the precedent was set. We have never recovered. What's the latest deal we have signed? Never recovered. Do you know that Germany had asked us, had asked to partner us to produce the Barut, age of 24? People don't realize it. Is there somewhere? Read it. Yes. Had asked to partner us. And we didn't pay attention. Why? Because we were committed to Jaguar. Then they begged us to give us a copy of um, Mark 20, uh, age of 24 to them. That's there in the Kutang Museum in Stuttgart. Now, go there. Nehru, again, was a man who nursed the nuclear weapons program from day one. Think of it. What a brilliant diplomatic coup that was. Here's a man who talked peace and disarmament and uh, Baba was the first chairman of the Atoms for Peace Conference in Geneva in 1955. And in the same breath as he was saying, peace, ye, wo, da, da, di, di. You see, in Geneva is where Baba uh, signed a secret accord uh, to get the NRX reactor from Canada, which is the workhorse for our weapons program from day one. There are people, again, if you read my first book, Nuclear Weapons and Indian Security, if you try to get hold of a copy, it's so masterfully done. Masterfully done. No one suspected it. That is strategic mind. But the great flaw in Nehru was he was indecisive. We reached the weapons threshold six months before China did. People don't know it. But while China went ahead and tested in October of 64, Nehru died in May of 1964, we had reached the plutonium reprocessing stage, which is the weapons threshold. In February of that year, we did nothing. Why? Because it was so secret in the government of India. Nobody but nobody knew about it. And Shastri who came in, uh, unfortunately, it was too small for the very big shoes that was uh, Nehru's shoes. And he had no idea what was happening. None of the Babu's civil servants knew anything. L.K. Jha, who was principal private secretary to uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri, didn't know anything about it. He kept Baba waiting. When Baba had the direct line to Nehru, the, by the way, the nuclear decision in Nehru's time was Baba, Nehru. That's it. There are no financial advisors. The only department of government that signs its own checks. Do you know that? No. They can say, this year we need so many thousand crores known to no financial advisor and financial advisor. 
cut a few rupees here, you know, take out some pennies there. No, they can write their own checks. There is no financial advisor looking over atomic energy thing. He surreptitiously, surreptitiously developed this covert, clandestinely developed this capability. But again, and it came to actually weaponizing. He said, Hakar Lege, not now, not now. So all great men have their weaknesses and their deficiencies and their flaws. This was the great flaw in Nehru, with a great strategist and statesman. But he was indecisive. Sagar Jashankar Bajpai, who was the uh, Secretary General, the first Secretary General of the Ministry of External Affairs, called him the Hamlet of Indian politics. Hamlet is that, to be or not to be. Indecisive, now not being able to make up his mind. So this is how India suffered. Not because there were no visionaries, not because they were no classical statesmen, but because they did not act when they needed to. So, so if that, is, that was the problem then, then it is the same problem now. Because uh, what we see here, we are importing Rafales. I have nothing against Rafale. Like, um, the government can have whatever fighters that they want to have until it serves the purpose of Indian security. I'm all okay with that. But uh, will it hamper? Because when we talk about Tejas, I mean, Tejas, can it really be called indigenously developed fighter aircraft when there are so many components? That we are from engine to the um, the courts and everything has been imported. So, no, please understand something about any military hardware design. If it's your design, it's yours. Components can be from here and there. It doesn't really matter. By the time you get into serial production and you it, you know you have economies of scale in production, is when things become, uh, shall we say, the cost benefit become equal. So let's not say uh, that because Tejas has uh, whatever proportion that are imported, uh, that it's not. It's Indian designed. The most important thing is the design, not the components or the assemblies that go into it, which people don't seem to understand. It's the design. It's the first design after the Marut HF-24 and the hf 71 that Raj Krishna, Raj Mahindra designed, which is our design. That's the most important thing. If the government only had the confidence and the, if it trusted the Indian talent and the Indian genius that we have, we wouldn't have imported any aircraft. And I'm sorry, there's no point in saying that this or that aircraft or this or that hardware, piece of hardware, improves our security and therefore this okay. No. No. Wrong way of looking at it. I've been advocating for years that the government should say, okay, no imports. I mean, you have Rajnath Singh's list, the no import list or whatever it is, they should what five or six lists. But you still have make in India. What is make in India? You're doing what uh, all our uh, defense public sector units have always done, which is what? Screwdriver things around. From kits, imported kits, complete breakdown kits. We just import them. Are you just screwdriver them? I don't know, when I was a, a boy, uh, and my dad was an engineer, and he, he used to buy me Meccano sets. I don't know whether you ever heard of Meccano. Meccano is a small little thing, strips, metal things, and so on. You looked at the instruction book and you screwed it together and you've created a truck or a, a crane. I remember doing it. And would that make me an engineer? No, no, I'm asking you. No. Well, so what have we done with just about everything we have imported and we think we have license produced? We say it's made in India. It's not made in India. Made in India is when you design a weapon system, not when you screwdriver a uh, damn thing and say it's make in India, very different thing. Apparently, in the Modi government doesn't seem to understand the difference between made in India and make in India. So, Rafal, I don't know what they're going to do, but well, then we bought the maritime Rafal for the aircraft carriers, 26. But I, I guarantee you that the 
rest of the complement of 126 aircraft of the Indian Air Force will also be the fault. Why? Because for the simple reason, they'll say, well, you know, you bought so many, and more you buy, the unit cost goes down, and you have economies of scale in terms of repair and maintenance, and therefore, naturally, they won out. So I've been opposing Rafan, any imports for years together. I fought with the Indian Air Force. I've been fighting people all the time. In, in the government, have the sense to trust your own products. Had you invested this kind of monies that you're putting in Rafal, do you know that our naval Tejas, we could have put in two engines, again, our design, you know, and flown the damn thing, which has been flown off a carrier dick. Yes. And yet you don't trust them? It's been, I guess, uh, what, uh, seven, eight years since it was flown first, the naval version of Tejas? Well, three years since anyway, the evening, like, the first flight it took was... In, the, off the deck. Yeah, off the off deck the it deck. was three, four years ago. Yeah. But that's the important thing. Yeah. Because when you off fly off the deck is when the ship is rolling. And yeah, pitch, right. You know, I mean, it's one thing to have a standard thing. You go off in Goa and you have the ski jump and all that. I'm not... That, that's easy. I mean, relatively easy. Mm. But when you're landing on a ship which is moving, mm. you're coming, I mean, you know, you have to, you know, fly into the wind to land. All kinds of stuff. It's a very complicated thing, my God. You know, it's like trying to land on a, uh, you know, thing coming in from the sky. Think of it. Yeah. And, you know, there's a spot out there and you have a pilot coming in, you're going to line up on the thing and so on and come in and land while the damn thing is moving. And if it's a bad weather, think of it, how difficult it is. Right. That's why they are the best of the best, the naval carrier pilots. But why couldn't they have stuck out with, stuck in, you know, stuck on with the Tejas Maritime? Nevalized Tejas, you bought 26 Rafals, which postpones the maritime nevalized Tejas. What happens to the nevalized Tejas? It has become second priority, right? Look at how the Chinese do it. Look at it. And I've argued this with, right here with Air Marshal and the Lord when they come see me. I said, Liar, look at what the Chinese did. They reverse engineered the MiG-15. They reverse engineered the MiG-17. They reverse engineered the MiG-19. They reverse engineered the MiG-21. Not license produced. Reverse engineered. Every component was reproduced in China and put it together. Then they bought the design from the Lavi design from Israel. Yes. And then they put it all together. This entire thing that they had accumulated of reverse engineering. We have never reverse engineered a thing. Do you know that? But sir, doesn't that, um, you know, uh, gets in clash with our concept of morality that we have? Oh, we are morality, morality, what, that's the whole point. Now, what do I say in my, why India is not a great yeah. power yet? You know, what's this in the Krishna Swami and these guys are talking about morality. Where's the morality? You pay the money for it, for damn it. If you pay the money for it, you should be free to do what you want. And you don't have to advertise to the world. You can do it secretly. That's what the Chinese did. Do you think they told the Russian law we were to make a copy of your MiG-15? No. No. They made it. And they were crap. The first series of aircraft that you reverse engineer will always be crap. But by the time you get to the third tier, the third block of production, you have a good aircraft. Will the first Nevalized, nevalized stages be great? No. It'll have problems. It's a tail hook problem, this problem, that problem, the weightage problems, you know, uh, landing speed problems, all kinds of problems. Yes. But you trust the goddamn pilots and the engineers to get into a feedback loop and correct the problems and fly it until it becomes a good plane. That's how you do it. Well, you don't want to do that. Because as you said, we all security, security, security. And if I was security, what? You want to go fight with the who? Oh yeah, Pakistan. No, I mean, what are you going to do? No, this is an excuse that we all give ourselves. And we say, ah, oh, you are security, you should go. And then it's a sacred cow. How does security strengthen in a country? Security is strengthened 
when you do things yourself for yourself, when you have you design your own armament, you are free then. You're genuinely free. Do you think you're free now? With everything imported? This is the great irony, and you want to be a great power. That's why Chinese laugh at you. I spent six months at the Chinese invitation with my sayings. I'm so rapidly anti-Chinese. They invited me. Do you know that? I was for, uh, you know, they asked me to be there for six months. I said, no, no, I don't want to be. So therefore, I so said, okay, okay, please. You won't be invited to Raj Bhavan if you are even one third of that critical of the government. No, I'm not. Even though everybody knows me, I'm not. You know, because, you know, they just create a real uh, you know, problem everywhere by speaking the truth. I say I speak the truth. I don't care because I don't, you know, the, the problem is um, I have never cared. And I came in because I always believed. And I, you know, all my friends when I was, I, you know, schooling in the University of California and so on, became plenipotentiaries in the U.S. government. My project mate, Dennis Ross, who was a plenipotentiary chief for envoy to the Middle East. During three presidencies, you know, A.C.W. Bush, uh, Clinton, and George W. Bush. He was a plenipotentiary for the Middle East stocks. My batchmate was Dennis Ross. I mean, this is how you get in people who come in, they have the expertise in government, they run the government, and then, you know, if you get good like Dennis Ross was, is continued with by, you know, uh, subsequent governments, and you leave your chart. But here no one cares for expertise. Everybody is a generalist. Every Babu, you know, they get a hist history or something. Sanskrit. Huh? History. Literature, English literature. Yes, yeah. And how is that going to help you making, you know, when you're such a generalist, and I've known people in the, I mean, in the defense sector post who have actually told me, uh, we don't understand, we are there for three years. Uh, for the first year, we just still have to groping around for what the jargons are, acronyms stand for. Mm -hmm. They said, we don't, you know, because I, yesterday I was in health and uh, public welfare. Sanitation. Ah, uh, sanitation. Today, uh, day before yesterday, I was in electrification. Uh, now I'm defense secretary. I said, well, I have to learn these things. I have to, I said, throw him out The rest of the world, they're all specialists. How do you think you're going to cope with them when you negotiate with them or talk with them? We are not serious. That's what I've said. That's why you'll never not be a great path. By the way, that yet there mm, yeah. is, was not mine. Mm. My thing was a de declaratory. Why India is not a great path? That's and my, How did yet come in? American editor said, Bharat, please believe me, it'll increase your sales, which it did. <laughs> if you say India is not a great path, everybody has generally no, okay, yeah, theek hai. yet is the one that, okay, yeah, kuch hope hai, kya kya? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Though I, I'm hopeful, but where systems are not in it. So, two parts, uh, just uh, one question, two part question. Uh, first, um, as you uh, said that uh, all these things of fighter jets, all these defense equipments are being imported. So, the problem is that um, the primary users of these platforms, uh, like Indian Air Force is the primary user of the fighter jets, tanks that we import from uh, Russia or any other country or the, or the assault weapons, guns and all, machine guns, that we import are basically the army is the primary user of those weapons. So they don't show faith or trust in DRDO or the weapon systems that are created by these PSUs. So if PSUs don't create anything, please get it out of your head. Sure. Those cl clods are, you know, they can't do anything right. Well, I'm carrying a license producer, not producing. Yes. It is screwdriver. The fact of the matter is that the one thing, good thing that has happened with the Modi government is at least these items are now saying that we need to be able to do it. So you have something like Vajra, for instance. Mm. That's an excellent howitzer, mm. unattract howitzer. Excellent stuff. And it's worked beautifully uh, in, in the mountains, in the Sikkim Plains, the northern Sikkim Plains up there. They're there, they're there, they're very good. Yeah? Because you trusted, you trusted LNT to internalize and in, indigenize the South Korean uh, system. It's a South Korean yeah. system. 
which we have internalized. But now LNT is grown in design. Now they have, uh, and then Kalyani, by the yeah. forge. Yeah. Tremendous. By the way, Kalyani was my junior in school. So, you know, I, I, you know all these people, you know, I mean, and he tells me, you know, I mean, I, the story I should tell you. He said that, you know, there was a great complaint from the Indian Army that the T-72 battles, the gun battles, mm. uh, would just fire out very quickly, meaning that it becomes so hot that you have to replace them too frequently. So Kalyani said, I'll forge a, a gun metal barrel, a rifle board if you want it, uh, at my own expense. I'll do it by the forge expense. And you put it on your tanks and see. And if you like it, buy it from me. A straightforward deal, costing army nothing, not a pesa out of the army budget. The heat and hot and so on, and all, he said, I'm, I'm giving it to you free. Just test it. They won't do it. And it turned out that it's a beautiful thing, better than the, uh, the original metallurgy on the barrel, which we now recognize with the Vajra, the Bharat Forge. Bharat Forge had an 5 millimeter mountain gun which we could have bought. Instead, we went for the M777 American. Yes. What hope do you hold out for a country that does that? But repeat. Aren't we still trying to use all these defense deals as, an, as a tool of diplomacy? Yes, but that's the whole point, as I said. You know, every, every time our prime minister goes somewhere, there's expectation that they'll sign on for some hardware, military hardware or something. Absolutely. So if it's a tool of diplomacy, how long can you afford such diplomas? Right. If it came mm. at no cost, I'd go ahead. But at what cost? Can you afford it? And then who gets it in the neck? The indigenous, indigenous programs that you have here, the private sector, which have built up tremendous infrastructure, designing and I mean, you have to go to see the LNT submarine design thing. The, I've always been plugging the LNT. But what a great, they are the people who produced, actually produced, not screwdrivering like the PSUs, the nuclear powered submarine. You would think that such a critical system as a nuclear powered ballistic missile firing submarine, a company that could do that would be able to do a conventional submarine, right? Much simpler technology. But no, they want to buy it from abroad, the Navy. 75i. You may have heard of. Explain that to me. It's frustrating. There's no sense. Just want to please the French by buying three more scorpions and a 75i with whoever gives you, I mean, I don't know, you yeah. know, to Musgau Dockyard. To Musgau Dockyard that never kept records. HL, which never kept records of all the engines we produced. Do you know that? There are no production records. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's all there. You know, all my books, you should read in detail. That's why people get very upset with me when I write these details. Because they, they can't refute it. Cab- cab- we have produced over 8,800 aircraft engines. And there's no record. We have produced, produced meaning, assembled together, but that a beginning of reverse engineering. That's how you would learn to reverse engineer. Well, if you haven't reverse engineered a thing, so it was never thought necessary. Sir, so, uh, one last question. Um, we never talked of China. The point I'm trying to make is that so many internal weaknesses, talking of China becomes irrelevant, really, yeah. because we cannot match up with China. Let's not fool ourselves. Just because you can put up a defensive posture and stance in the dark in a of Pradesh doesn't mean that you're going to win a contest should it come to it. And therefore, I've been saying vis-a-vis China, let me just say this. How do you, I've said, how do you neutralize the Chinese superiority, conventional military superiority? I said, we have to go nuclear. It is something that a weaker country uses against far stronger adversaries like North Korea used against America, like Pakistan used against us. We should use against China. 
we have, I've said, you have to have a very forward deployed tripwire, nuclear tripwire. I've been advocating atomic demolition munitions, it's a suitcase sized bombs that you put in the mountain passes in Himalayas and announce it to the world and the Chinese. If you ever invade, we will bring down the mountain sides. And then we'll destroy you in detail. The your group armies that are this side of the mountain collapse. We'll destroy in detail. Once you come to, into the Arunachal Plains, in you know, the Brahmaputra Plain, the side of the mountain ranges. Why is that a very doable thing? I've argued in my books. In this one, by the way, if you saw my last uh, somewhat chat to it, I've explained that option, which I've been sending to the Indian government. And hopefully, we might, anyway, whatever. So, um, what happens there? You essentially have a trip where in... Um, by the way, atomic demolition munitions can be very easily engineered. They're very easily designed. It's not a very complicated thing. And once you have that, it's usable. Why is it usable? Because what's the thing against nuclear weapon usability? It's a radioactivity. Right? Nagasaki, Hiroshima. People in the skin coming off. It's an awful, you know, sight. But what happens if you have an atomic demolition munition that brings down a mountainside? There's no radioactivity. You know why? The gamma rays, which is the most dangerous rays emission from nuclear explosion, are the best absorbent is Earth. So when the mountainside collapses on the explosion, the whole things the, the group armies will be budded without venting of radioactivity. And I've argued. Once you do use the nuclear weapons that way, it becomes a defensive weapon. You wouldn't initiate it. The Chinese did. Chinese were warned that this is the trip wire. Please don't come this side of our natural. You know, or you know, be aware. We don't we'll not tell you where they are. This is the McMahon line. This is what we believe. And on that basis we'll emplace atomic demolition munitions. I also said forward deploy your uh, Agni ones, the 700 kilometer. Why? Because Chinese missile concentration is the largest, most dense of any place other than the Fujian coast opposite Taiwan. The second biggest missile concentration, Chinese missile concentration, is Lhasa. And therefore, I've said we have to have, therefore, have a forward policy in terms of our nuclear weapons deployment and use that as a nuclear trip fire, because conventionally you may not be able to fight them. And again, there's so much ahead of us in cyber and uh, communications and so on, that again, you are disadvantaged. So from a disadvantaged position, how do you fight an adversary? And this is how you do it. I've explained it in great detail. And I, I think uh, the army journal, the, the Center for Land Warfare Studies, asked me to uh, write a thing for them, which I did in the winter edition of last year. came out sometime earlier this year. I proposed it. I hope that the government is seriously considering it because let's be very clear that we shouldn't be deluded. We delude ourselves into thinking we are a big power. We can handle it. No, you can't. You're not a big power. And therefore, you have to take hard measures, which we seem incapable of doing. So we come back to the same thing. We can talk of China all you want, because that's the main and only threat in their faces, whom we are not able to deal with in any adequate fashion. So the last question which I was going to ask was, so, okay, India is not able uh, or not capable enough to take on China. Um, but America is, the Western European powers are. But what we see there, that uh, when it comes to Russia, uh, they seem very determined. They they seem like they are willing to go to any extent. CIA can go on and blow up bridges and do, like, harm anything in Ukraine and they are willing to pay any cost except the human life of American or Western human life. They are willing to fight till the last Ukrainian. 
um, but when it comes to china they don't seem that serious or they don't take the chinese threat as serious as they and sometimes it feels like um, i mean they're forcing russia to be the villain to keep russia as a villain because now uh, when you start talking like uh, that okay we will be taking ukraine in nato and you start uh, drafting papers and you start uh, asking zelensky to you know come on and join nato obviously you are poking russia you are you, willingly you are doing it so, but so that you know they don't have to focus on much on china don't you agree that um, the amount of focus resources and everything west is investing on russia it should be invested on china why so you want the west to fight your battle no, it's not my battle but no it's your battle because sorry No. This is where we go wrong. Mm. Please, please, this is a strategic way of perceiving threats. It's not just your problem. It's the government of India, the military. But it is. Hey, America, why not? Hey, America, what are you doing? In Thailand, what are you doing? So they look after you. Why should they concern themselves with China when they trade with China? They make so much money out of China. Why is Germany so reticent in upsetting China? Do you know that? Because they sell, you know, how many two million Mercedes Benzes last year in China? Do you think they're going to upset you, uh, upset them, please you? They are going to reorder the threat perception accordingly. That's why Germany is telling America, please, China se panga matlo. Because we have great trade going. We sell millions of Mercedes, just the, the great money, the revenue earner. And by the way, I think you got the Ukraine thing wrong, if I may say so. What has really happened in Ukraine is that from day one, it's true that the the U.S. and NATO have been interested in Ukraine continuing the fight with you know with the Russia. Why? To keep it mired in a land war. Except that Russia has acquired what they always sought. They have the Crimean Peninsula. They have now the control and command of the Black Sea, from Sevastopol and the Sea of Azov. And they have the what I call the land bridge over the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. The oblast in Russian term means small states, which constitute the corridor connecting Crimea to Russian mainland. They have it. They had it within three weeks of uh, and uh, they started the operation. And by the way, what's his name? Uh, Nikolai Nikolai Patrushev, who is the secretary of the National Security Council of Russia, that just said uh, some days back. He said, uh, "You know, we s- almost signed a treaty with Ukraine on March twenty nine, twenty twenty two. They started their." Operations, the special military operation on twenty fourth February, twenty twenty two. By twenty ninth March, they had an agreement with Ukraine, and he says, according to him, it was negative. We agreed on it that morning, draft treaty, peace treaty. By evening, they said no. They're not going to sign it because of American pressure. Now. So isn't it like the first half of my question that uh, America wants this fight? Yes, that's right. They, they are poking Russia. That's right. They are poked, and they, they think that Russia is going to be that easily poked. Look, people don't realize with Russia one of the things that if you go into history, which the Americans don't seem to understand, although for they 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 seem to design history to serve their purposes, it's the wrong way to look at history. But Russia is. has always invariably started very slow when you go into war look at what happened with operation barbarossa in 1941 barbarossa was 41 42 whenever when the nazis came within 50 miles you know within what 50 i think 12 miles of russia or moscow the soviet moscow yeah What happened? They couldn't resist the German onslaught. But once they began building up, once they began coming into getting the momentum, then they were unstoppable. 
Who do you think defeated the Nazi? Soviet Union. Wehrmacht, yeah. Soviet Union. Yeah. Not the goddamn allies. Right. Right? Which is what was understood by Winston Churchill and Frederick uh, Delano Roosevelt in the summit at Yalta in 1945. They understood when Stalin said, we be the Germans and we will have a cordo senator. We will have entire zone of buffer states or we'll take it or we'll take it because in the world well, they gave them Eastern Europe a Finlandized Eastern Europe and Russia, Russia do not get into a clinch with Russian bear that's why the Americans don't want to fight Russian bear what did Jake Sullivan say after the Vilnius summit uh uh we don't want to get into a land war. No one in NATO wants to get into a land war. Yeah, let Ukraine fight. We'll supply them arms. We don't have boots on the ground. So, they, should, you know, they are very respectful. It's the Ukrainians who are foolish. And they are playing Zelensky for a fool. Where he seems he's a comedian. Yes. A, you know, before he became a prime minister. And I admire him for his fighting spirit. But you should also know that you're fighting with a weak card when you're in a, in a bridge game. When you know you have a weak suite, you do not push it. And against Russia, you went fooling around when you had this peace treaty. So, again, do not buy. I mean, our Indian media just reproduces Western crap. I'm saying, have, do no one learns history. I mean... I read Leon Trotsky, who was the first commissar of the Red Army. I read his books. And he talks about how, how during the Civil War of the Revolutionary Period, they had problems with Ukraine. Do you know that? Yes. Yeah. There's the first commissar of the Red Army, Leon Trotsky, writing, you know, we had real problems with Ukraine, where they were tough fighters. So nobody's surprised that Ukrainians fight. The surprise is that Zelensky and Kiev doesn't, they don't recognize when the game is up and that they are being played by the West for their reasons. So when you say, well, you know, they have to concentrate on Europe and what happens to China, Ariba, what China is our problem? Let's deal with them without any expectation that someone is going to come and handhold you and fight for you. Why would they want to fight China? With the goddamn frontline state, fight it. Do whatever has to be done. Establish relations with Taiwan. Openly. Even as they fool around with Pakistan, their nuclear missile on Pakistan. I've been saying since my time, the National Security Advisory Board, the first one, during Vaj Bhai's time when it was set up, I asked the foreign secretary then, some chap called Raghunath, an idiot. He came before us in a plenary. I said, why did you not consider the option of nuclear missile arming all the neighbors of China's periphery? You know what that fool of a foreign secretary, which is normal for the MEA, tells me in a plenary session in the NSAB, he says, because it's not practicable, Mr. Karnad. I blew up. I said, practicable, Mr. Foreign Secretary? Practicable? At least say you don't want, you that you are risk averse. You don't want to take even a little bit of risk. Of course there is risk of a war with China. But would you rather always, always be on your knees? And I remember, before we uh, close this uh, discussion, uh, today's discussion, I remember, I guess, uh, about 15 years ago, you were there on NDTV English and uh, there was a program going on. I still uh, remember that uh, debate and uh, you had proposed the uh, uh, idea that uh, why can't we give uh, nuclear weapons to Vietnam? Yeah. And uh, a similar retired foreign secretary, uh, his response was, are we out of our minds that we are even discussing this on television? And the word, the analogy that you have used for the foreign secretary, that, that's what the, exactly the word that came into my mind. 
for him that i mean if they are so scared about even discussing the idea i mean how are these guys going to you know uh, actually achieve it or do it on ground or implement it i lost all hopes that day uh, but um, not all hopes are lost till you are there sir <laughs> so no i i know becoming older there's nobody there to was thinking like me i'm sorry to say i'd hope to a time that there would be people younger scholars younger you know policy analysts who would be hard headed they believe in real politique mm. who who do not take anything for granted and and learn to live it the damn means i always said that we have lots of money now earlier we didn't have the money uh and then we didn't use what the largest we got from russia to show we to did you know we got weapons free you know that yeah 30 years at 3% or 2% yes. interest yes. it's virtually free money free yeah. right and the great goshkar it's he who said you should have a nuclear power submarine it was not an indian idea do you know that that i did is a great marshal sergey goshkar after whom the aircraft carrier was named which is now vikramaditya vikramaditya fittingly he is the one who said take it he is the one who offered us in 1971 of august the tupole tu22 bomber Number. strategic bomber we said no thank you we want the mig 31 tactical aircraft because as i remember when commander gole he was became air marshal gole cb gole he tells me and he was on the team with air marshal shivdev singh going to moscow where an entire squadron of tu22s were lined up with indian air force roundels painted on them because they couldn't believe that india would not take it when it was offered to them and shege goshka was the defense minister he said i have the tu22s taken a squadron who do you think he was giving it against china but our mind is so determinedly tactical and short range that cv goli tells me and he was the test pilot going with air marshal shim dev singh to moscow and he says uh said okay i'll test drive it as it were. so he goes to the shamita airport is winched up true the if you go into a russian plane as i have been in russian war planes these are very basic they don't believe in 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 spoiling you if you want to be spoiled you sit in a rafale aircraft or mig mirage you know where economically or aram says whether if you're sitting in a damn video pod i'm exaggerating but you yeah. get the point the russians believe in ruggedness they don't you know they're not there for you know serving your comfort levels so they are hard you know the machine but they very rugged they don't give up easily you can run the plane through hail storm through inclement weather fly it rough they won't give up the machines don't give up try running the mirage through uh, difficult times they need air conditioned carriers you know the hangers. the, the hangers in gwalia go see them that cost a bomb who are you building this for cause can understood hey these are we are like you because we came up from nothing we had nothing we are used to nothing because we are used to hardships they're not used to comfortable f16 type things they are all rafals but we have fallen into the western trap look at our air force people so the point to make is you don't even know what is good for you i'm not talking about the bribes and the corruption and other things that attend on these kinds of contract and these i'm not talking about but the very fact that you don't appreciate hard machines that are rugged that serve your purpose or oh, you are a third world country you are not a first world country people say trillion dollar economy what trillion dollar economy it's on do you know what how it is calculated the ppp calculation that's the uh, parity calculation that dollar value it's notional 
It's not. It's real real. wealth. Yeah. It's uh, not to say that India has not progressed yeah. economically. We have. But we should not delude ourselves into believing that, you know, oh, well, we're going to be the second largest, third largest economy. Are Baba, yes. But what's your per capita income? Right. So, I mean, we have seemed to have no sense of what we are, where we are. And the ironic, not ironic, in contradistinction to India is China. They are very hard, materialistic. They know exactly what the deficiencies are, what they need to do, by what time to do it. That's why when Xi Jinping talks about, by 1949, establishing a Tiangxia. Tiangxia is, I think described in one of these books, Harmony under the heaven. Their model. Harmony under the heaven. How do you get harmony? On Chinese terms, of course. When everybody caters to your terms, that's really your harmony. And that's the harmony the Chinese are propagating. This is real habit by 1949. We have to ensure that they don't get it. And you're not going to do it by riding on American shoulders. Or expecting the weight in the Western NATO to fight for you. They'll do what is good for them, not what's good for you. Doesn't the simple thing, is that not understood by us? Apparently not. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us.